Well, if you'll turn to John chapter 6, we're going to be looking at the first 15 verses. Um, And I bet you who were raised in Sunday school and Bible school have known this this miracle since you were about three. (laughs) Uh, When Jesus fed the 5,000 from the little boy's lunch. Uh, I think there is a huge significance to this old, simple story because this is the only miracle of Christ's ministry that's in all four Gospels. Now, when God repeats something twice, that's important, but four times? (laughs) This must be the most significant of the miracles. Also, this was the miracle that Christ did that was seen by the most people Now, he often, in crowds, healed everyone. They came up to him, and he personally touched them or said something or healed them. But in a crowd, who would be able to see that? Just those those right there. Uh, They may have known about it, but uh, at least 5,000 adult males saw it because that's the word that the Greek uses when it talks about the 5,000 people that ate. But if even half of them brought their wives or any of their 12 kids, <laughs> this is a huge group. Uh, could be fifteen or 20,000 people. Now, I know when we have a potluck, we have a lot of food, and if we piled it up on a table, it would be a big pile. But how much is it going to take? <laughs> to do this Uh, well and it's also a situation I've never seen this until I studied it is an occurrence where Jesus deliberately puts his disciples in a very difficult situation Uh, and they're going to feel like this situation is impossible how many of you know anything about an impossible situation how many of you have several right now (laughs) Uh, you know we have health problems and they can't seem to be fixed and we think what will I do Um, there are people who aren't married who wish to be married and think they'll die if they're not married there are people who are married who wish they were married to someone else (laughs) Um, there are people who have wayward kids or grandkids, and it breaks their heart, and everything they've done doesn't work. There are people who don't have money to meet a pressing need. Uh, There are people dealing with grief and loss, and it just hurts so bad, it seems like there's no way to come out from under it. And I will just tell you, if you look at the news, I'm sure you feel, as I feel, that America is just going down the tubes. And so what will happen? It seems an impossible situation to remedy. Now, I know that y'all are all Bible students and that you believe that God can do anything, right? Jer- I've given you references on your sheet, Jeremiah thirty-two seventeen. He said, Behold, Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. And then in that chapter 10 verses later, God agrees with him. He says, behold, I'm the Lord God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Now that's a lot of belief. But Jeremiah also wrote Lamentations. And there's a verse in there that says, God, you have covered yourself with a cloud and my prayer is not getting through. Ever felt that way? Well... It's all a matter of perspective. I remember trying to ride a bike. I thought I would never learn. And in truth, it did take me two or three days. (laughs) But I did learn, and it was possible. Well, let's look at John. Uh, Verse 1 says that after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is up here in the northern place where the Jews lived. He has left Jerusalem because of the resistance of the Jewish leaders, and he is up by the Sea of Galilee. Bethsaida, we only know where he was because Luke said the place. 
But Sayada is up on this shore, right in the corner. Now it looks like other things are there because on this map they have put names right close to Bethsaida. Actually, this is a pretty barren place around there. Um, it's going up into the Golan Heights that we still hear about today. And verse 2 says, a great multitude followed him. Uh, that's an interesting word that I had never examined until this time studying. The word multitude in Greek means disorderly rabble or a throng of unruly people. Hmm. <laughs> what a group. Uh, an unruly mob is following him. Now that's good because they're following him. But the rest of verse 2 says the reason why they followed him. Why was it? Miracles. They wanted miracles. Do people follow after Christ today for the purpose of achieving miracles? Right. Well, it said he did miracles on those that were diseased, and that's the same word John used in chapter 5 in the last lesson about the impotent man laying by the pool of Bethesda, the powerless man. So uh, they liked the magician physician. I don't know how much they liked the teacher. Well, verse 3 tells us Jesus had gone up into a mountain or a steep hillside there by the Sea of Galilee, and he was there with, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> with his disciples. Uh, the other par uh, parallel passages in Matthew and Mark say it was a desert place. It was a deserted place. Bethsaida was a small fishing village. It was not a important place. I couldn't find the population. I hope it was bigger than Cana, <laughs> but maybe not too much different. But he has brought the disciples there because they have just gone out on their first teaching, preaching mission. And sometimes I look at these guys and I wonder if Christ was a nail biter while they were gone. I can't imagine sending these guys out to heal diseases and cast out demons. But he did. And they have come back very excited because what he said happened. By the power of the Spirit, they were able to preach. They were able to orchestrate miracles. And they were thrilled to death. But they were also exhausted. In fact, Mark tells us they had been so busy they had not had time to eat. I know you have shifts like that, Alicia. <laughs> Sometimes you're just busy, you don't even have time to eat. And so Jesus has said, uh, come on, let's come apart and rest. Uh, Jesus understands that we need rest. Maybe not at the time frame we should be doing something else he commands, but we do need rest. And so Jesus is going to use this group of 12 tired, emotionally drained people I know you who are teachers know after you teach, you just feel exhausted. I do. I'm wasted on Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> There's nothing left. I'm just exhausted. But he's going to use these people in this situation. And then we're told in verse 4 that the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. This is probably the last Passover before the one at which Christ dies. Now, when you smash up all the Gospels account and see them side by side, I'm going to tell you some things that come before what we see in John. Uh, Mark tells us that the crowd had been listening to Jesus' teaching at this time all day long. And Mark says Jesus taught them many things. Luke says he taught them about the kingdom of God. Matthew says he healed all the sick. And Matthew and Mark say that he felt compassion for these unruly people. Sometimes when I see unruly people, compassion is not what I feel. <laughs> uh, 
In fact, Mark says he looked at them and thought they were like sheep without a shepherd. And the word compassion in Greek doesn't just mean he felt sorry for them. It means come alongside someone and help them. You might have known times when you uh, asked somebody how they were doing and they said they were not doing well. And there, at that point, you have a choice. Am I going to back off and say, well, I'll pray for you? Or am I going to say, what can I do <laughs> to help you in this? Jesus had compassion. And Luke says when he saw the crowds, the unruly folks, he welcomed them. Uh, the Greek word is received in the King James, but he welcomed them. And two things have already happened. This long teaching healing day with unruly folks and tired disciples, the sun is about to set. And they, the disciples come to Jesus with a brilliant idea. They say, tell these people to go home. There's no place to buy food out here. And the sun is almost down, and they don't have headlights on their sandals. <laughs> Send them home. And when they said that to Jesus, Jesus said to them, you feed them. Do you realize he gave the disciples that job? I didn't until I saw the mashup today of all, of all the uh, four Gospels. Uh, you know, food in ancient days is probably more significant than to us because we have so much food available. But they lived in a culture where harvests were uncertain and taxes were very high and you didn't have money. And there were a lot of people who didn't eat on meals. Uh, this is important. Well, verse 5 says... Uh, Jesus lifted up his eyes, and now he is looking at this whole company. At the place close to Bethsaida, there are like two hills and kind of a valley in between. I believe he was there and looking up on the hillside. Uh, they were seeing him, and he was seeing them. He lifted up his eyes and saw a great company that had come, and so he says something to Philip. He asks Philip a question. Someday I'm going to do a Bible study on the questions of Jesus. They are very interesting. <laughs> Did Jesus ever ask a question for information? No. Why did he ask people questions? He did frequently. To get them to think about something. So he says, Philip, where shall we buy bread that these people can eat? Now, I think he asked Philip for two reasons. Number one, Bethsaida was Philip's hometown. And Bethsaida was Philip's home, hometown, along with Peter and Andrew. So he knew what was there, just like you know where to eat in the town you live. And also, he had an accountant's brain. Some of you have numbers brains. I do not. <laughs> And he has already been thinking about this when Jesus had told the disciples, okay, you guys feed them. Uh, verse 6 gives us a precious insight. And Jesus said this to prove or test Philip. Because Jesus knew what he was going to do. What's he going to do? Provide it for everybody. What did he want Philip to see? You, you can't do, Philip, can you do this? <laughs> now, there is a very wonderful pronoun in that question. He said to Philip, not where are you going to buy bread, but where are we? He is in this with Philip. I think this is like a midterm term exam for these people. Do you ever have one of those horrible English exams where you go in and there's just one question? And you have to write an answer correctly. <laughs> Essay. Oh, me. Everything is writing on one question. <laughs> uh, and I think Philip was rather flattered that Jesus asked him. Uh, 
And so look at his answer in verse 7. Philip answered and said, 200 penny worth are 200 denarii are 200 days wages for a worker. That much bread is not sufficient for them that everyone could have enough <laughs> just to buy it. Now, I tried to figure out 200 days wages. What percentage is that of a year's wage? And I think I did this right, Janice. <laughs> if they work six days a week, that gives you 312 working days in a year. And 200 of those days would be about 65%. Now, I expect you do your taxes and you have some figure of what your annual income is. And Philip said 65%. That's a chunk of change. <laughs> How much money did Jesus and the disciples have? Very little. Just one guy could carry it in a bag. <laughs> and I don't think it was a giant bag. So Philip is confronted with this impossible situation. And he says, what we need is more money. <laughs> because we don't have any place to buy that much food. And if we had place to buy it, we wouldn't have the money to buy it. And if we had a place and the money, uh, we wouldn't have enough money to get enough for everybody, but to have a little bit, a bite. So Philip says, this is impossible. Well, good, Philip, right answer. <laughs> Did Philip even answer the question Jesus asked? Do you see how his accountant brain had switched it all to a matter of, of money? It's interesting and I did not realize this until study for this lesson. In the Bible, the number 200 has some rather bad associations. Uh, I have given you some of them in your margin over there. When Achan, the guy from Joshua's army that stole some money out of Jericho, when all the money was supposed to go to God, what he saw first was 200 pieces of silver. And that turned him on to it. Micah is the guy from Judges 17. Uh, he was a guy who took 200 pieces of silver and made an idol out of it. Absalom was a guy who, when he cut his hair every year, it weighed 200 shekels. And when he had his revolt against his father David, he had 200 guys with him. Do you see how 200 is not looking good? <laughs> and in Revelation 9, where it talks about a destroying army that comes up out of the Euphrates River and kills a third of the people on the earth, it's 200,000,000. ,000. So if, you're, if you like numbers, when you see 200 in the Bible, it's not always, but all, most times, it's... Uh, Something's not good. Yes, Philip, your 200 days of money won't do it. <laughs> it's not enough. Uh, now, we also know from the other Gospels, Mark in particular, Jesus has said to his disciples after they figured out they didn't have money, all right, how much bread do you have? Go look. And so... Then we have verse 8 and 9. As a result of the search, apparently only Andrew <laughs> has anything to come up with. Uh, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Jesus is going to use very insignificant things. Little lad, the Greek word is for a little child that may be a slave child, and the master could do whatever he wanted to with him, even kill him with no impunity. This little insignificant boy. These loaves, I hate that that word got in the King James because we see loaves of bread, or maybe smaller loaves of banana bread. <laughs> 
but we see something big. The Greek indicates something like a cracker, a flatbread, a small flatbread. Think Ritz. <laughs> he has five Ritz and two very small fish. Now, my husband likes to fish, and in years past he did, and we had fish, but he never got any fish and kept them that was that big. That's kind of what the word is. Uh, the commentators say that in Jesus' day, people caught those little fish like anchovies and smoked them or seasoned them, and they were like something to have when you had bread that didn't have any taste. <laughs> and... Um, Somebody says that it's barley. It's John, <laughs> which was the, the worst grain to make bread. The best bread was not from barley. It was something else. Uh, many years ago, when we had an exchange student from Japan in our home, whom we loved, uh, he would go to an international food store and buy some small smoked fish, and they were about that big. And when he opened that bag, the aroma filled the kitchen, and I left the kitchen. <laughs> it smelled terrible. I don't, I'm not sure what they were. They might have been. But he, they had been dried, and he ate them. Scales, skeleton, guts, and all. Crunch, crunch, crunch. I thought I would die. <laughs> This tells you what kind of food the people were, were using. Um, so Andrew, sa Andrew says, we've got a little kid. And this is probably not his lunch. It might have been the snack his mother prepared for him. Five Ritz and two anchovies <laughs> or two sardines. Well, yes, Andrew, what is that <laughs> among 5,000 men or maybe 15 or 20,000 people? And I don't know if you look at what you have to meet your impossible situation, but I bet you have said, Lord, this is not enough. I don't have emotional strength for this. I don't have resources for this. I have a little bit, but what I have is not enough. So finally, the light dawns on the disciples. He told us to do this. We can't do this. Ladies, that's what God is speaking to us through our impossible things. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I am a fixer, and there are impossible situations I have worked with all my heart and strength on for years. <laughs> because I want to make them better. And I think, when am I gonna figure out? It's impossible. I can't do it. I can't make it even a little better. Well, they're in a good place. So now Jesus kind of changes gears in verse 10. He says to the disciples, make the men, and that's a word for mankind, make the men, the women, the kids uh, sit down. Uh, in this culture, people sat down to eat or they reclined. So he said, make them sit down to, he didn't say to eat, but that would be the normal thought. Uh, now that was a test for the disciples, wasn't it? Suppose somebody said, why are you making us sit down? What are they going to say? No sign of food besides those writs and sardines. <laughs> um, it reminds me of when God came to Noah and said, I want you to build this huge boat. And there wasn't any sign that there was going to be a flood for a very long. They didn't know what a flood was. They didn't know what rain was. So God often asks us to trust him when there is no sign that our impossible task will be resolved. Uh, verse 10 goes on to say, now there was much grass in the place. So the men, and that word is for the males, sat down about 5,000. That's how we get he fed 5,000, but that was 5,000 men. Now, 
I have a very wonderful book that has modern satellite maps of the Holy Land. This is an enlargement of the Sea of Galilee. Can you see that little green up there that's different from all the brown around it? That's where Bethsaida is. It's still got grass. Now, I don't know what time of the year this was made. There are some green, like, farm squares down here, but uh, nothing else. <laughs> it's all brown and barren, and they, are, they are, have grass to sit on. Isn't that just like God? Before we even know we're going to need something, he has it there. One of the ministers I read had a story from a woman in his church uh, whose husband, she said, was an incurable romantic. Oh, they should all be. <laughs> and every birthday, anniversary, or gift time, he brought her roses because she loved roses. Every color roses there were. And she adored how they looked, how they smelled, the texture of them. And she was thrilled with her gifts. But one year, he bought her a dozen artificial roses. Uh-oh is right. <laughs> uh, she tried to act appreciative, but she was biffed by that. She didn't like artificial roses. She liked real roses. She stuck them in a big vase and set them on the dining room table where they never went <laughs> for a long time. And finally, every time she passed by, they irritated her. She thought, I'm, I'm packing these up, and she did. Put something else there, and her husband never noticed. She put them in a box in the back of a closet. But it was not long after she did that that her husband unexpectedly died. And, of course, she was devastated. He was a young, youngish man. And in her grief, several months later, she was looking for something, and she went in the closet and found that box. Oh, now she wanted those. She put them back on the table, and every time she saw them, her heart was warmed with a happy thought of her dear husband. God had him do something ahead of time that would help her later. And I don't know what it is that you need, but God may have already gone before. Uh, look in your closet. <laughs> God is very wonderful in providing for us before we know we need it. Well, verse 11 says Jesus took the, that little boy's lunch, and what was the first thing he did? Gave thanks. Matthew, Mark, and Luke say he looked to heaven when he gave thanks. That's what a Jewish father would have done at a table before eating. He would have stood and looking to heaven, given thanks to God for the food that they had. Uh, now, you don't have to stand to give thanks. I wonder, do you give thanks? Do you give thanks when you're eating alone? Do you give thanks when you're out at a restaurant? Or is it the casual thanks? <laughs> where nobody will know what you're doing. Um, one preacher told about a rather poor farmer who was eating in an upper-class restaurant with a wealthy man. And uh, when the food came, the old farmer bowed his head to thank God. And the rich guy, he, after he was finished, said, You are so old-fashioned. Nobody does that anymore. And the farmer says, well, that's always been my habit. But you're right. There's some that live on my farm that don't give thanks. And the rich man said, well, at least they're intelligent and sensible. Who are they? He said, my pigs. <laughs> so don't be a pig. <laughs> uh, did you know in the Bible, over a hundred times, it tells us to be thankful? That is one of the greatest cures for depression there is. Because it's so much easier for our minds to be consumed with what's wrong instead of all the blessings God has given. <laughs> well, 
That is why James Bell makes people who are depressed read the book, Thank You Therapy. <laughs> and he, like love life for every married couple, he has hundreds. <laughs> if you are depressed, he'll be glad to throw one your way. <laughs> All right, he took the loaves, he looked up to heaven, he gave thanks, and then it says he broke that. Um, but when he broke it, instead of it disappearing, have you ever stepped on a Ritz? Stepped on a Ritz cracker? I mean, that's inter, uh, instant breaking, isn't it? <laughs> and maybe to 200 little crumbs, but he's got thousands to feed he broke it he was creating new stuff new stuff kept coming from his hand how big a pile of food would it take to feed 20,000 an awful lot I wonder if that's the most volume of new stuff Jesus made since creation I don't know. And what does he do with what he made? Verse 11 says he gave it to the disciples. And the disciples to them were, that were sitting down, the bread and the fish. Think about this. This bread came from grains that had never grown in the earth. It had never been harvested or processed. That fish came not from eggs from the mama fish. That fish had never swum in polluted waters. What he made had never touched the corrupted earth. You think it was good? <laughs> How good was it? <laughs> really good. Um, and we know by what happened next, because the last part of verse 11 says they ate how much? As much as they wanted. Have you ever been in a place where there's free food? Have you? What do people do? <laughs> Eat too much. Um, in fact, verse 12 says when they were filled, and that's a word used in animal husbandry, when they were foddered up. I talked with our uh, beautiful veterinarian about that, and she said you do have to be sure that animals don't have more than they need to eat. Sometimes you have to take an animal out of the field where they want to eat because they will eat too much, and that's the word here. They were foddered up. <laughs> Uh, and Jesus said to his disciples, gather up what remains, the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. You could never say he was wasteful, was he? Did he trash the hillside? Did it look like a rock concert when everybody left? Uh, Good things to be part of our lives. And verse 13 says they gathered the, the uneaten fragments together and with them they filled 12 baskets. And it's the Greek word for a large measuring basket, like a bushel or a half bushel, like you buy a whole bunch of apples or corn or something in. Not a little basket you throw your keys in by the door, <laughs> but a great big basket. They fill 12 big baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above to them that had eaten. And I just, being a woman, I will guarantee you, there were some women there that said, I'm putting some of this in my robe, and I don't have to do breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to keep this. With everybody eating all they wanted and maybe even taking them, there was still food left over. Well, that's a good lesson, isn't it? I've heard preachers say, Jesus is all you need. And that's a lie. He's more than you need. <laughs> He's over and above <laughs> what you need. 
and what he has to give to you. Now, some commentators said that was the crumbs in the glass, grass they picked up, which got on my last nerve <laughs> because the Greek word means a fish, a piece, a piece of it, uh, not a crumb. And then we know from the other Gospels, immediately Jesus told his disciples who were standing there holding 12 baskets, get in the boat because of what the people were going to say. Verse 14, then this crowd, this rabble, this throng, and this is the word for every men, women, and children, not just the men. When they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, they have an epiphany. <laughs> they say, this is of a truth, that prophet that we expected would come into the world. They are referencing the verse I have on your sheet from Deuteronomy 18:15, where Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, and him shall ye hear. Jesus was like Moses in several ways because he had the ability to lead people out of bondage. And because now he is feeding people in a wilderness place <laughs> with all this food, and not just with food, with superb food. And their wheels are turning. Wouldn't it be great if we could get him on our side and him to lead us out of Rome's bondage? This is who we've been waiting for. And verse 15 says, when Jesus perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him their king, he left. Now, I think he had sent the disciples off because they might have been part of that group that wanted him to be king. Because after all, didn't they spend a lot of time talking about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom? Yep, that was their agenda. One preacher said that um, he was in the Holy Land and riding a bus from Israel down to Egypt through the Sinai Desert. And he started thinking about Moses and what he faced. I wonder if Moses thought this is an impossible task. Yes, he told God that several times. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. Uh, when they were leaving Egypt... And they got to the Red Sea. If, Jesus, if God just opened that up for a narrow pathway, there were probably at least 600,000 men plus women or children because they are numbered soon after leaving Egypt. Uh, they would need a space that was miles wide so they could march several abreast to get through the Red Sea. Uh, Every time they camped at the end of the day, they needed uh, 750 square miles. Now, you could find it, but it was wilderness. And now you've got all these people that need to be fed. He tried to calculate how much food would it take for the number of people that Moses had. He came up with about 150 tons of food every day. What food was in the wilderness? None. None. They do have animals. What do you need to cook animals? You have to have wood. How much wood was in the wilderness? He talks about freight trains, um, two freight trains a mile long to bring the food. Firewood would be many more freight trains a mile long to bring uh, 4,000 tons of wood. Forty years they were in the wilderness. You got this many people, you would need at least 11 million gallons of water a day if everybody just cooked with it and washed their hands and face. Uh, that would take a freight train with tank cars 1,800 miles long. And Moses was out there when there was nothing. You know, I respect that man. But he knew it was impossible for him. It wasn't just a little bit impossible. <laughs> it was out the roof impossible. But he trusted God. No wonder they looked at Jesus and said, this guy's like Moses. What is the lesson? I need you to help me here. 
what is God trying to tell us? And he put it four times in the ministry of Christ for different accounts. What does he want us to get? Trust him and do what he says. That's two good things. What else you got? That's the big one. We're bankrupt. We can do nothing. So why do we labor in grief and misery under our impossibilities? I think many in this room could have that testimony. When we could not do it, God did it. But the sad thing is, we were in pain for a long time before we looked up. Before we admitted, Lord, you're right, I can't do this. Well, ladies, um, this is a wonderful passage, isn't it? And one I need to think about all day, every day. <laughs> Thank you for your presence. I'm thinking.